My name's Joe Biden. <laughs> I'm a Democrat. Admired. But Lindsay, this one's hard. The three men who have spoken before me, I think, captured John, different aspects of John, in a way that only someone close to him could understand. But uh, the way uh, I look at it, the way I thought about it, was that uh, I always thought of John as a brother. We had a hell of a lot of family fights. <laughs> we go back a long way. I was a young United States senator. I got elected when I was 29, and I was had the dubious distinction of being put on the Foreign Relations Committee, which uh, the next uh, youngest person was uh, 14 years older than me. And uh, um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, traveling the world because I was assigned uh, a responsibility. My colleagues in the Senate know I was chairman of the European Affairs Subcommittee. So I spent a lot of time on NATO and then the Soviet Union. And uh, along came a guy a couple years later, a guy I knew of, admired from afar, your husband, who had been a prisoner of war, who had endured enormous, enormous pain and suffering, and demonstrated uh, the code, the, uh, the um, McCain code. People don't think much about it today, but imagine having already known the pain you were likely to endure and being offered the opportunity to go home. But saying no, as the son can tell you, the Navy, last one in, last one out. So I knew of John. And John became the Navy liaison officer in the United States Senate. There was an office uh, then it used to be on the, on the basement floor of members of the military who are assigned to senators when they travel abroad to meet with heads of state or other foreign dignitaries. And uh, John had been recently released from Hanoi Hilton, a genuine hero, and uh, he became the Navy liaison. For some reason, we, uh, we hit it off from the beginning. Um, we were both full of dreams and ambitions and an overwhelming desire to make the time we had there um, worthwhile, to try to do the right thing, to think about how we could make things better for the country we love so much. And John and I ended up traveling. Um, every time I went anywhere, I took John with me or John took me with him. And we were in China, Japan, Russia, Germany, France, England, Turkey, all over the world, tens of thousands of miles. And, uh, and we would sit on that plane and late in the night when everyone else was asleep and just talk, getting to know one another. We talk about family. We talk about politics. We talk about international relations. We talk about promise the promise of America, because we're both cockeyed optimists and really believe that there's not a single thing beyond the capacity of this country. I mean, for real, not a single thing. And, uh, and when you get to know another woman or man, you get to know their hopes and their fears, you get to know their family even before you meet them.
you get to know how they feel about really important things. We talked about everything except captivity and the loss of my family, which had just occurred, my wife and daughter. Only two things we didn't talk about. But I found that uh, it wasn't too long into John's duties that uh, Jill and I got married, and Jill is here with me today. Five years, I had been a single dad, and, uh, and no man deserves one great love, let alone two. And I met Jill, who changed my life, and, uh, and she fell in love with him, and he with her. He'd always call her, as, as Lindsay later would travel, he'd always call her Jilly. And, uh, and uh, matter of fact, uh, when they'd get bored uh, being with me on these trips, uh, I remember going to see Carmen Lee's in Greece, and he said, why don't I just take Jill to dinner? I later learned that they're down on a, on a, uh, a cafe on a, on the, at the port, and he has her dancing on top of a cement table drinking ouzo. <laughs> Not a joke. Chili. Right, Chili? <laughs> So, uh, but um, we got to know each other well, and he loved my son, Bo, and my son, Hunt. As a young man, he came up to my house. He'd come up to, to Wilmington. And uh, out of this grew a great friendship that transcended whatever political differences we had or later developed, because above all, above all, um, we understood the same thing. All politics is personal. It's all about trust. And I trusted John with my life, and I would, and I think he would trust me with his. We both knew then from our different experiences that, uh, and as our life progressed, we learned even more, that there are times when life can be so cruel, pain so blinding, it's hard to see anything else. The, the disease that took John's life, took our mutual friends, Teddy's life, the exact same disease nine years ago, a couple days ago. And three years ago, it took my beautiful son Bo's life. It's brutal. It's relentless. It's unforgiving. And it takes so much from those we love and from the families who love them that in order to survive, we have to remember how they lived, not how they died. I carry me with, with me an image of Bo sitting out in a little lake we live on, starting a motor on a little boat and smiling and waving. Not the last days. I'm sure Vicki Kennedy has her own image, maybe looking, seeing Teddy looking so alive on his sailboat out in the Cape. And for the family, for the family, you will all find your own images, whether it's remembering his smile or his laugh or a touch in the shoulder or just running his hand down your cheek. Or just feeling like someone's looking at you and turning and see him just smiling at you from a distance, just looking at you. Or when you saw the sheer joy that crossed his face the moment he knew he was about to get up and take a stage in the center floor and start a fight. <laughs> God, he loved it. <laughs> so to Cindy and to the kids, Doug, Andy, Sydney, Megan, Jack, Jimmy, Bridget, and I know she's not here, but to Mrs. McCain, we know how difficult it is to bury a child, Mrs. McCain. My heart goes out to you. And I know right now the pain you all are feeling is uh, so sharp and so hollowing, and John's absence is all-consuming for all of you right now. It's like being sucked into a black hole inside your chest. And it's frightening. But I know something else, unfortunately, from experience. 
that there's nothing anyone can say or do to ease the pain right now. But I pray. I pray you take some comfort knowing that because you shared John with all of us your whole life, the world now shares with you the ache of John's death. Look around this magnificent church. Look what you saw coming at the state capitol yesterday. It was hard to stand there, but part of it, part of it was, at least it was for me with Bo standing in the state capitol, you knew it was genuine, it was deep. He touched so many lives. And I've gotten calls, not just because people knew we were friends, not just from people around the country, but leaders around the world calling me. Megan, I'm getting all these sympathy letters. I mean, hundreds of them and tweets. Character is destiny. John had character. While others will miss his leadership and his passion, even his stubbornness, you're going to miss that hand on your shoulder. The family, you're going to miss the man, the faithful man as he was who you would know would literally, not figuratively, give his life for you. And for that, there's no bomb but time. Time in your memories of a life lived well and lived fully. But I make you a promise. I promise you. The time will come, because what's going to happen is Six months will go by, and everybody's going to think, well, it's past. But you're going to ride by that field, or smell that fragrance, or see that flashing image, and you're going to feel like you did the day you got the news. But you know you're going to make it when the image of your dad, your husband, your friend, crosses your mind, and a smile comes to your lip before a tear to your eye. That's when you know. And I promise you, I give you my word, I promise you, this I know. That day will come. That day will come. You know, uh, I'm sure with my former colleagues and all who work with John. I'm sure there's people who have said to you, not only now, but the last 10 years, explain this guy to me. <laughs> right? Explain this guy to me. Because as they looked at him, in one sense they admired him, but in one sense they, the way things have changed so much in America, they look at him as if John came from another age that live by a different code, an ancient, antiquated code where honor, courage, character, integrity, duty, where it mattered, because that was obvious how John lived his life. But the truth is, John's code was ageless, is ageless. When you talked earlier, Grant, you talked about values. It wasn't about politics with John. He could disagree on substance, but it was the underlying values that animated everything John did, everything he was. He could come to a different conclusion. But were he part company with you, if you lacked the basic values of decency, respect, knowing that this project is bigger 
than yourself. John's story is the American story. That's not hyperbole. It sounds like it's the American story, grounded in respect and decency, basic fairness, the intolerance for the abuse of power. Many of you have traveled the world. Look how the rest of the world until recently looks at us. They look at us as a little naive. We're so fair. We're so decent. We're the naive Americans. But that's who we are. That's who John was. And he could not stand the abuse of power wherever he saw it, in whatever form, in whatever country. It's always about basic values, John, fairness, honesty, dignity, respect, giving hate no safe harbor, leaving no one behind, and understanding that as Americans, we're part of something much bigger than ourselves. Well, John was a value set that was neither selfish nor self-serving. John understood that America was, first and foremost, an idea, audacious and risky, organized around, not tribe, but around ideals. Think of how he approached every issue. The ideals that Americans have rallied around for over 200 years, the ideals that the world has repaired to, an idea enshrined in the Constitution, sounds corny. We hold these truths self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. To John, those words had meaning as they have for every great patriot that has ever served this country. We both love the Senate. Proudest years of my life for being a United States Senator. And I was honored to be Vice President, but being a United States Senator. And we both lament it, watching it change. During long debates in the 80s and 90s, some of the colleagues who were around then would know, I'd always go over and sit next to John, next to his seat. Or he'd come over on the Democratic side and sit next to me. No, I'm not joking. Because we'd sit there and we'd talk to each other. And I can remember the day when I came out to see John. We, were, we were reminisced about it. It was in 96. And we were about to adjourn for what we call the caucuses. There's a luncheon once a week that all the Democratic senators have lunch together and all the Republican senators. And we both went into our caucus, and coincidentally, we were approached by our caucus leaders with the same thing. It was raised as a discussion. Joe, it doesn't look good you sit next to John all the time. I mean. <laughs> Swear to God. Same thing was said to John in your caucus. That's when things began to change for the worse in America, in the Senate. That's when it changed. What happened was, at those times, it was always appropriate to challenge another senator's judgment, but never appropriate to challenge their motive. When you challenge their motive, it's impossible to get to go. If I say you're doing this because you're being paid off, if I say you're doing this because you're not a good Christian, if I say you're doing this because you're this, that, or other thing, it's impossible to reach consensus. Think about it in your personal lives. But all we do today is attack the oppositions of both parties, their motives, not the substance of their argument. This was the mid-90s. Well, it began to go downhill from there. The last day, John was on the Senate floor. What was he fighting to do? 
who is fighting to restore what we call regular order, to start to treat one another again like we used to. Scent was never perfect, John. You know that. We were there a long time together. But I'd watch Teddy Kennedy and James O. Eastland fight like hell on civil rights, and they'd go have lunch together down the Senate dining room. John wanted to see, quote, regular order writ large, get to know one another. You know, uh, John and I were both amused, and I think Lindsay was at one of these events where John and I received two prestigious awards. Uh, um, the last year I was vice president and then won immediately after for our dignity and respect we showed to one another. We received an award for civility in public life. There's a college, Allegheny County puts, uh, College puts out this prestigious award every year for bipartisanship. And John and I look at each other and say, what in the hell's going on here? <laughs> no, not a joke. I say to Senator Flake, that's how it's always supposed to be. You're getting an award? No, I'm, not, I'm serious. Think about this. Getting an award for your civility. Getting an award for bipartisanship. And classic John, the one at Allegheny College, there were hundreds of people there, and we got the award. And John, the Senate was in session, and so he spoke first. And as he walked off the stage and I walked on, he uh, looked at me and said, Joe, don't take it personal, but I just don't want to hear what the hell you had to say. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and left. One of John's major campaign people was now with the Senate, with the governor of Ohio, was on this morning and having a shaving and happened to watch it. And he said that uh, um, Biden and McCain had this strange relationship. They always seemed to have each other's back. Whenever I was in trouble, John was the first guy there. And I hope I was there for him. And we never hesitate to give each other advice. He called me in the middle of the campaign and said, what the hell did you say that for? <laughs> well, not an issue. Like, you just screwed up, Joe, you know? And I'd occasionally call him. Look, I've been thinking this week about why John's death has hit the country so hard. Yes, he was a long-serving senator with a remarkable record. Yes, he was a two-time presidential candidate to capture the support and imagination of the American people. And yes, John was a war hero who demonstrated extraordinary courage. I think of John, and I must say my son, when I think of Ingersoll's words, when the will defies fear, when duty throws the gauntlet down to fate, when honor scorns to compromise with death, that is heroism. Everybody knows that about John. But I don't think it fully explains why the country has been so taken by John's passing. I think it's something more intangible. I think it's because they knew John believed so deeply and so passionately in the soul of America that he made it easier for them to have confidence and faith in America. His faith in the core values of this nation made them somehow feel it more genuinely themselves. His conviction that we as a country would never walk away from the sacrifices generations of Americans have made to defend liberty and freedom and human dignity around the world it made average Americans proud of themselves and their country. His belief, and it was deep, that Americans can do anything, withstand anything, achieve anything, 
was both unflagging and ultimately reassuring if this man believed that so strongly. His capacity that we truly are the world's last best hope, that we're the beacon to the world, that there are principles and ideals greater than ourselves and worth suffering, sacrificing for, and if necessary, dying for. Americans saw how he lived his life that way. And they knew the truth of what he was saying. I just think he gave Americans confidence. John was a hero. His character, courage, honor, integrity. But I think the thing that's under, understated the most is his optimism. That's what made John special. Made John a giant among all of us. But in my view, John didn't believe that America's future and fate rested on heroes. What we used to talk about, and I liked most about him, is he understood what I hope we all remember. Heroes didn't build this country. Ordinary people being given half a chance are capable of doing extraordinary things extraordinary things. John knew ordinary Americans understood that each of us has a duty to defend the integrity, dignity, and birthright of every child. They carry it. That good communities are built by thousands of small acts of decency that Americans, as I speak today, show each other every single day. That buried deep in the DNA of this nation's soul lies a flame that was lit over 200 years ago that each of us carries with us, and each one of us has the capacity, the responsibility, and we can screw up the courage to ensure that it's not extinguished, and it's a thousand little things that make us different. The bottom line was, I think John believed in us. I think he believed in the American people not just all the preambles, the Constitution. He believed in the American people, all 325 million of us. And even though John is no longer with us, he left us pretty clear instructions. Quote, believe always in the promise and greatness of America, because nothing is inevitable here. Close to the last thing John said, to the whole nation as he knew he was about to depart. That's what he wanted America to understand. Not to build his legacy, he wanted America to remind them to understand. I think John's legacy is going to continue to inspire and challenge generations of leaders as they step forward. And John McCain's impact on America is not over. It's not hyperbole. It is not over. I don't think it's even close. Cindy, John owed so much of what he was to you. You were his ballast. When I was ever with you both, I could just see how he looked at you. Jill's the one when we were in Hawaii and he first met you there, he, he, he kept staring at you and Jill finally said, go up and talk to her. And Doug and Andy, Sydney, Megan, Jack, Jimmy, Bridget, you may not have had your father as long as you would have liked, but you got from him everything you need to pursue your own dreams, to follow the course of your own spirit. You are a living legacy, not hyperbole. You're a living legacy and proof of John McCain's success. Now John's going to take his rightful place in the long line of extraordinary leaders in this nation's history, who in their time and in their way stood for freedom and stood for liberty and have made the American story the most improbable and the most hopeful and the most enduring story on earth. I know John said he hoped he played a small part in that story. John, you did much more than that, my friend.
to paraphrase Shakespeare, we shall not see his like again. <laughs> <laughs>